Okay, everybody, welcome back. This is the last slide that we left off with in the end of lecture number two. So this is the third lecture in discussion of seric tibase restoration of dental implants. So we left off talking about making sure our patients are prepared. Um, I like to oftentimes order my parts, uh, ordering these parts here once the surgery is done. So I'll order the parts um, like the same day the surgery is done. Now if, it's, if the patient's coming from an outside surgeon or the surgeon that's in my office, as soon as I get clearance, um, this clearance right here, then I'll go ahead and order the parts and we'll put them somewhere safe and get the patient on the schedule. Um, but this is basically the flow of what we're gonna do and when, and remember this continuing care step. This is something that's oftentimes overlooked. I would suggest to you as we're going through the design discussion that you consider doing the imaging and design and the lab processes steps separately um, from the delivery. So meaning that this step is done, um, then the patient's dismissed. And then you do this step on your own when you have time, when you're not stressed, the patient's not sweating, worrying about you designing a restoration you've never designed for a patient before. And then you have them back right here for the delivery when it's a good experience for you, real quick and easy, and a good experience for the patient. And then of course, continuing care. I like to see them two weeks later for an adjustment on the occlu occlusion if needed, and to make sure the tissues are healing properly and talk about post-operative um, care. So that's again, a real quick process overview of the whole process of implant restoration. Okay, so let's go back to our course objectives. Um, this is our third course objective, and this is the one that's gonna take the most time, talking about actually making the restoration. So we're talking about achieving aesthetic, meaning looking good and efficacious, meaning functional um, implant abutments and crowns. And remember, we have two types. We got the hybrid abutment crown, hybrid abutment crown, and then we've got the hybrid abutment with a separate crown. Um, that should be right there. So two types there, we're gonna talk about both of them, give you a demonstration on both of them. So let's dig in. Let's first talk about design indications and contraindications. So what are we gonna use it for? What are we not gonna use it for? Let's look at this. So this is taken directly from the Serona um, instructions for use for the tie base. Um, this comes, you can download this online if you wanna look at it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read through this. I think it's important that we understand what the tie base is used for and what it should not be used for, which we'll get to here in a second. So, the Serona dental CAD CAM system is indicated for taking optical impressions to record the topographical characteristics of teeth, dental impressions or stone models by computer-aided design and fabrication in patients that require dental restorative prosthetic devices. That's a mouthful. The system also features the processing of mesostructures, a dental restorative prosthetic device used in conjunction with endosseous dental implant abutments. So I like this word that they use, the mesostructure. The system that uh, features the processing of mesostructures comprises titanium bases tie base, Incorus ZI meso blocks, and Serona dental CAD CAM design and fabricating devices. Tie bases are attached to an implant as prosthetic titanium base for adhesion to mesostructures to restore function and aesthetics in the oral cavity. Okay, so we got it. All right, that's what we're gonna use it for. Basically anything that's gonna restore function and aesthetics in the oral cavity. Um, I have not ever used in chorus. Um, I have used, of course, the tie base and the Serona Dental CAD CAM design process, which is CEREC, C-E-R-E-C, -E -E which stands for Chair Side Aesthetic Restoration of Economical Ceramic. Chair Side Aesthetic, rest aesthetic Restoration of, of Economical Ceramic, or Economical Restoration of Aesthetic Ceramic. <laughs> or you can just say Ceramic Reconstruction. All right, so here's the contraindications. Insufficient oral hygiene. You've got to make sure your patients have good oral hygiene, okay? Good oral hygiene. Insufficient space. If there's not enough space, if they've got some collapse of the arch, if they've ground their teeth down to whatever, um, you've got to make sure you have enough space. Bruxers, this is a contraindication. 
It's a relative contraindication, but it is a contraindication. Um, and for restorations with angulation correction of more than 20 degrees. And we're going to talk about this in a lot of detail to the implant axis there. So angulation correction of more than 20 degrees. So if this is 90, that's 45. This is my best shot at 22 and a half. So if you've got correction of more than that much or about that much, then it's a no bueno, okay? And for individual tooth restorations with free end saddle, that's a cantilever type hanging off the end. Um, and for restorations whose length exceeds a ratio of 1 to 1.25 in comparison to the length of the implant. And let me just highlight that out for you. Let's just say this is our dental implant. All right. And then let's say this is our abutment. I know it's a bad drawing. And then this is our crown. All right, that's a circle, it's a lollipop, all right? So what we're comparing, um, the length ratio, is this to this, all right? So this is roughly one to one, I'm guessing. That's a pretty good, you know, that's roughly one to one. But when this starts to get longer, then you're starting to violate this one-to-one -one ratio in comparison to the length of the implant. So you have to be very, very cautious. And the reason for that, it's all about torque. All that torque ends up right here at the interface and that can cause issues for the implant and also issues for the tie base and the ceramic. So we gotta make sure we pay special attention to these um, indications and contraindications. All right, so here's a couple of angulations questions. Um, and this is kind of free-handed measurement um, here's an implant. This is an implant that I placed directly into the distal root crypt right here after the tooth came out. Um, bone graft, of course, in here. Um, and this was the restoration appointment. That's 24 degrees. So that is past 20 degrees, obviously. That's a 24 degree angle correction. 24 degrees. All right, right here. So according to strict adherence to the Serona recommendations and instructions for use, this is something that we should not be doing. Now I did it and it turned out just fine. This implant has been in service or the crown has been in service. I think we're going on four years now. Um, no issues. Um, it was serving the patient well. He's actually had more bone filling in around these areas in recent x-rays. So no worries with this particular indication. Um, although again, this is pushing past the recommendation for use. Here's one that's even more extreme. Um, this one also was into the distal root crypt of an extraction, and that's 28 degrees. Um, that's a pretty significant angle correction. Now we know that there are some studies that came out recently that we can go as far as 45 degrees, and as long as the force is directed appropriately on the dental implant, in the end, you'll be just fine. So we don't want to push it though. We do not want to push um, the design parameters. And what I would suggest as we're going through this, um, if you're going to push something past, you know, the, the recommendation, uh, the indication by the manufacturer, if there's a failure, it's your failure. It's not the prosthetics failure. I want, I want you to be clear on that. Um, this is something I learned from a doctor in Colorado. If you push something past the design limits, for instance, if you have a Emax block and you want to do a five unit bridge out of an Emax block, if you push it beyond the design limits, that's a failure if it fails. That's a failure that's on you as a clinician, not on the material. And so you have to be prepared to deal with that if it's your failure and not the material's failure, okay? So um, we talked about this angle correction of 20, more than 20 degrees to the implant axis. Um, let's dig into this guy right here. Um, 1 to 1.25 in comparison to the length of the implant. Um, and this is where we start to talk about crown height space. Okay, so we're measuring these spaces. All right, so let's look at this just a little bit. This is an Ankylos D8. This is one of the big fat mama implants. I love these implants here. These are great. I put that one in. Um, so what is that? You know, we got this roughly circle right around there. If we're measuring from the interface here up to the crown, well, that length is obviously more than that length. And is it one to one, more than one to 1.25? I think so. 
that might be one to one and a half. So this, again, if you're following the instructions from the manufacturer, is a no-go. But again, I did this and it worked out just fine. Um, worked out just fine. So just like I mentioned a moment ago, if you have a failure, this is a failure that's on you as a clinician, not on the material because these are tested rigorously at the manufacturer and that's why they make those recommendations. Um, incidentally, these areas, of course, were cleaned. This is excess cement. This was before tie base. This is not a tie base, obviously. That's a stock abutment um, with a serrate crown that was made to fit it. But that was immediate post-insertion before we'd clean off that excess cement. Um, now, this one is a tie base here. You can see the tie base in there. And this one may be even a little more extreme. So there's the length of the implant. And then let's look at the height of the restoration. You know, it's even off. So when you compare that to that, yeah, that's approximately equivalent. Um, this again is way past the manufacturer's recommendations for the stand, from the ratio of length um, or crown height space as it pertains to the length of the implant. So again, this would be a no-go if you're adhering strictly to the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, but again, I did this and this one's been in service for three years with, with no issues. So. Why do we want to worry about that crown height stress so much? Well, here is a study that talks about crown height stress distribution and short dental implant components. And as you can see here, the problem that we see is screw loosening and fatigue caused by the skewing of the stress distribution to the transverse section of the implant. So let me draw you another little diagram. This is my excellent dental implant diagram. Um, let's just say you've got a tie base that's engaged inside the implant and you've got a really nice crown that comes up off the top of it. That's my beautiful crown. Looks like an ice cream cone, doesn't it? It's great. But here's the tie base. I'm going to draw just a little kind of a ghost of what the tie base looks like inside there. And so you've got a, let's just say this is the screw and it's going down inside the implant. Right, perfect. Okay, wonderful diagram. All right, so as this gets longer, let's just say, you know, we make that up to here. What happens is as the chewing force comes over here, that's going to translate to a bunch of force in that area, right over here. And vice versa, as the force comes over here, that's going to translate to a bunch of torque over on that side. So what we see is this crosswise torque, if you will, um, contributes to this screw loosening that we see. Um, and the issue isn't necessarily that we're gonna have a failure of the screw, but we'll have it loosen over time because essentially that crown is rotating back and forth under the torque of the chewing forces. Now it's not actually moving, but the force is creating a moment which is causing the screw effectively to loosen over time. So it becomes really important if we have these taller crown height, um, crown height lengths, um, crown height spaces is what I was trying to say. It's really important that we manage the tightness and the torque of the screw. Okay, so here's another study basically talking about the same thing. The increase in crown height, increase in crown height, enhanced stress concentration at the implant bone tissue interface and increased displacement of the bone tissue, mainly under oblique loading. So that causes issues with potential overload on the bone tissue, right where the implant meets the bone. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of an obvious thing to say, but if we have a dental implant that meets the bone, the more, the higher that implant is, the longer the fulcrum arm, and the longer the lever arm, which uh, translates to a really strong fulcrum issue right there at the bone, um, which could potentially cause bone loss periimplantitis, et cetera, and implant failure. So be very cautious. Try to, to, to adhere to the recommendations. All right, so here is a cross section of our little hybrid abutment crown with a tie base inside. Okay, so here's some of the minimal minimum recommendations. Um, wall thickness, of course we have, here's our wall thickness right here. Um, must be larger than one and a half millimeters around the entire equatorial circumference. Okay, so we got to have one and a half millimeters of ceramic outside the tie base. Okay, and that 
little ledge on either side of the tie base is kind of the minimum that it has to be. The opening of a screw channel is not to be located in the area of contact points, that's kind of a no-brainer. If this is not possible, a hybrid abutment with a separate crown should be preferred. The width of the hybrid abutment crown is limited to 6 millimeters from the axial height of contour to the screw channel. So that's this width right here. So you can't have a crown that's wider than 6 millimeters either way. And what's the reason for that? Well, number one, you may not be able to have a block that's that big, um, but number two, uh, it also creates that free end saddle issue. So you have chewing forces here, um, that's going to contribute to this rocking motion um, on the implant, on the abutment, which puts all that torque into the screw and can also distribute the torque into the implant bone interface, which if that's the bone, it puts all that torque right there. So we want to minimize that rotational moment that's created by chewing when you have something that's wider, uh, wider than six millimeters from the screw channel interface. All right. And then it just basically says follow the recommendations. All right. So let's talk about the hybrid abutment. Kind of the same thing, except the wall thickness must be 0.5. So this little wall thickness, 0.5 millimeters. Um, hybrid abutment should be designed um, in a similar way as the prepared natural tooth. And here's the idea. We want a rounded shoulder or a chamfer. In order for the crown to be cemented to the hybrid abutment using a conventional self-adhesive cementation protocol, retentive surfaces, and a sufficient, sufficient um, preparation height must be observed. Um, duh, right? We want to make sure that the implant is placed at the right height so that there's enough emergence on the tie base to gain enough so you can actually have a crown that'll stay on there. I've seen cases where after the implant is, is placed, they put the tie base in, and now you've literally got the opposing tooth that comes down like right here. So what do you have, like four millimeters of height? And that's not even enough room to put in an abutment. Crown width B, that's this width, needs to be six millimeters from the axial height of contour to the screw channel. This is the same as the hybrid abutment crown. And then we gotta follow all the recommendations from the manufacturer. So the nice thing about it, this area right here, this whole little section um, is automatically done for you. The CEREC does it all. The CEREC will automatically create a nice shoulder It'll automatically do it. So once you get to the design process, which we'll get to here in a little bit, um, the CEREC machine will create that interface without you having to do anything at all. So this, you can just check that off. It's done. Um, we have to pay attention to this. Um, and then you, of course, have to double check that everything adheres to the manufacturer's recommendations. Okay, so we've talked about indications, contraindications. Um, we dug a little bit through um, some of the recommendations from the standpoint of the manufacturer. Um, we're going to leave it there. I'm going to stop this video now um, and we'll go ahead and jump into the next video which is actually a deep dive into a step-by-step -step design um, using the CEREC Omnicam in version 4.4 of the software. I know 4.5 is out. Um, it's not that different from 4.4 um, so this is still very appropriate and uh, this will make a lot of sense to you. So thanks again for watching. Look forward to seeing you in the next video.